Most of you have heard of Dr. Klinghart. Uh, he is a scientist of our age, really digging in for answers in today's epidemics. And I have to say, he's always on the cutting edge. Many people have said, you and Dr. Klinghart have to get together more and more. So our teams brought us together in this interview, and you're going to hear some of the most exciting things that uh, of our time that you are going to get the benefit from. And uh, you're also going to hear some surprising things that we resonate on. Uh, what about all this genetic testing and SNP testing? What about all the microbiome testing? Uh, well, you're going to have to watch this episode to hear our responses. And what is the greatest threat of our day and age? And what can you do about it? Well, you're going to have to hear from one of the greatest scientists uh, today doing some of this research on this episode of Cell TV. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm Ashley Smith, and today we welcome Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, who is the founder of the Sophia Health Institute. Dr. Klinghart is internationally known for a successful treatment of chronic pain and illness, and has contributed significantly to the understanding of metal toxicity and its connection with chronic infections such as Lyme. He is considered an authority on this subject and has been instrumental in advancing various fields within biological medicine. We are such huge fans of his work and are excited for this opportunity to have him on Cell TV. So let's get started and welcome Dr. Klinghart and of course, Dr. Pompa to the show. Welcome both of you. Yeah, nice meeting you guys. Yeah, yeah no, Dr. K, that's what uh, your staff called you. I like that. I thought it was very affectionate. So, uh, Anyway, it's just such a pleasure uh, to be here today. And uh, you and I have, you know, we're out there lecturing in this world on detox. And gosh, you know, so many times people come up to me and say, gosh, you and Dr. Klinghart really need to talk. You know, you guys really resonate on a lot of these topics and same subjects. But today I, I want to focus on Lyme. I, I, I said I haven't done a show on this in a while, but you and I have a lot of the same feelings around Lyme, and I want to bring out our strategies. Well, I want to bring out your strategies. I can share mine anytime. I want to bring your strategies to my viewers and listeners and, um, and your thoughts about Lyme. So uh, thank you for being here, and let's just uh, let's crush it. Actually, I had to stop you right before the interview because I'm like, no, that's great. You started talking about Lyme and the, kind of this history about the, where Lyme started in Connecticut, but how it's different than some of the other strains say. I'll let you share that, but let's open this conversation wide open right now. So go yes. at it, finish your, finish your thought. Yeah, so um, what brought Lyme into the public consciousness was a strain of Lyme that, uh, that caused severe illness, you know, starting in the 70s and moving forward from there. And it really did start in Lyme, Connecticut. And it's just almost a miracle that we had some very, very smart, intelligent physicians there who realized that it was, that it was different from what they've seen before and, and that they uh, called the right people on the plane to actually diagnose that whatever people were made sick by was in fact uh, an infection. And so, however, uh, Klinghardt comes to America in 1982, uh, had a full working knowledge of Borrelia infections and the impact on neurological illnesses. You know, that, that it was very well known in Germany that many psychiatric and um, neurological illnesses were caused by chronic infections. In fact, it was very well known in the Third Reich and used by the destructive forces of Hitler. You know, he had already the first biological warfare lab um, where bugs were groomed for making large populations sick and then they were sprayed on you know via airplanes on uh, large populations in the ukraine and russia and, and other places in order to bring the population down just simply to weaken them to make them tired to make them fatigue and um as you know from some of the early books written the lab 257 was one of them but also now the more shocking insider report from chris newby the book Bitten uh, reveals that the um, that the the bug that escaped or was 
seated uh, at, on Plum Island that actually, you know, went across the little small piece of ocean uh, to the next town, which was Lyme, Connecticut, that those uh, affected with that bug got very, very seriously ill. And the genome that has been cracked, um, the, the listeners should know that a regular bacteria, a uh, very evolved bacteria may have 15 or even 20 genes that would be a lot for bacteria. Now, the, the most intelligent bug until fairly recently was syphilis that had somewhere around 30 genes. Come along like the first full genome that I helped co-paying in Germany on an American patient that we extracted the Lyme disease. Um, his Lyme spiral kids had over 800 genes. And this is simply something that doesn't grow in nature. You know, so, and there were sections of Epstein-Barr embedded into the Lyme gene and sections of mycoplasma. And that brings up the issue, you know, when we diagnose people here and we do a test for mycoplasma and for the herpes viruses and people are positive on all of these, um, the question is, is it actually separate bugs or is it just one long box where uh, dist different parts of the genome of other uh, virulent bugs have been integrated? And so um, what we're dealing with really is two illnesses. You know, we have the man-made lab created version of Lyme spirochetes, which is very aggressive because it's a very devastating illness, mm. and very hard to treat. And then there is the background of natural occurring Borrelia infections, which probably has always been there. Mm. We know that Ötzi, the Iceman, you know, the, the, uh, the man that was found in the Alps, in the Austrian Alps, he was 5,300 years in ice embedded entombed and it was full of Lyme spirochetes mm. but the variety that had only 27 genes so it was an early um, uh, culprit that was more intelligent than any other bug of that time but not 800 genes <laughs> it's a big difference right right Me, so, meaning the, the man-made one obviously and so, being 800 and so uh, among the Lyme literate physicians this is not generally known and People kind of think, okay, well, I have some hard cases of Lyme and I have some easy cases of Lyme. And what I'm proposing here is that the difference actually is that they're not the same illness. You know? And so uh, in terms of diagnosing Lyme, you know, we've gone around the block with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Western blood was for a long time the right. gold standard here in the US. Um, now we prefer the, uh, the test from army labs, uh, they use the lymphocyte transformation test, which is a more sensitive test which, with a higher detection rate. And then there's some newer PCR-based tests that mm -hmm. we've explored and yeah. we've been very, very successful having had a very, very sensitive test. But then the lab was visited by the FDA and yeah. told the lab that they're overdiagnosing Lyme disease, that they have to change their detection rate on the, the bar above which they're reporting. And so um, lab testing is still in its infancy, I would say. And the, the definitive diagnosis of Lyme really can be made with the biopsy. You know? And so the, the leading pathologist with that was Alan McDonald. He's still alive. He's still lecturing. He was brilliant. You know, he did biopsies of people that died of Alzheimer's disease and found the brain full of Lyme, living Lyme spiral kids. He did the same with autistic kids with their brains. And he did the same with virtually any neurological illness and found uh, not in just a small fraction of them, but in all, the, all of them, he found um, living Lyme spiral kids inside the myelin sheath of the nerves, happily living in there. And so, we are operating here in this office under the assumption that everyone with psychological or psychiatric problems and everyone with any type of neurological problem should be suspected of having uh, Lyme at the core of, of the illness and that has served us very, very well. Mm. So based on that, we have developed our own 
approaches uh, to to treat the illness. You know, yeah. You probably well, know. well, let's let's uh, let's talk about that. You know, and one of the things that um, I had said that you know I had found clinically um, in my group of doctors that um, I train and work with closely is that it's very difficult to get the Lyme out. Um, it's intelligent, this, or, you know, this bacteria, and it will find itself hiding from the immune system in and around heavy metals. And when we deal with the heavy metals, we can definitely go to a whole nother level. Um, so what, what has your experience been with that? Yeah, so uh, of course it goes back a long, a long way. So one of the cofactors of Lyme always was mercury. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you know, we observed a number of cases where uh, we had uh, patients' amalgam fillings removed because of yeah. a testing, and people crashed really badly. And it turns out that a steady release of mercury from the dental amalgam fillings is actually a moderately successful treatment for Lyme disease, you know, because Lyme suffers from the mercury just as our own cells do. And so that was a big discovery and however taking out the de um, detoxing mercury still is helpful because the yeah. immune system is damaged by it and right. it by it and so to get the immune system back on board we need to we need to sneeze <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well uh, now he Good. Dr. K has the coronavirus. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm joking. We were just we were discussing that before this. If you watch this or listen to this, uh, that will date this video. I'm going to have a tonight, and I'll be fine again. I love it. So the connection with the lime and and heavy metals or metal toxic metals in general is very complex, and so um, we know that. Lime only becomes treatable when we take the mercury away. Yeah. So that's an important part. But the other one that's also published is that one of the most important growth factors for Lyme spirochetes is aluminum. And so mm -hmm. one of the big things that we do in the office here, we focus early on on detoxifying aluminum from the brain and from the nervous yeah. system. And it has been a very rewarding. Uh, and mercury and aluminum in the brain have this synergy that's very nasty, as you know. And so you, you have to deal with both of those, especially in the brain. And I find that's what a lot of practitioners fail to do is really deal with it. You know, oh, yeah, I did a mercury or a, a heavy metal detox. But you and I both know it. You know, it, it takes time to get it out of the deep tissue, especially the brain. But there lies the magic. Yeah, and and so that's really the the secret to treating uh, Lyme disease. I mean, the the orthopedic form of Lyme disease is easy to treat. You mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, where yeah. you may use antibiotics and some ozone injections in the joints, and you're done. But if it's deep in the limbic system, you have to have a whole different uh, yeah. approach to it. And yeah, and uh, it's always going to be a combination of detoxifying and then treating the infections and modulating the immune system as those three pillars. I, I, I couldn't uh, agree more. And we'll talk about some of your strategies here in a moment. But now part of the strategy, and I, I want to get to this, so we, the heavy metals and lime, there's a connection. Now a new problem, EMF. You've been very outspoken uh, about the EMF connection with lime. And I and quote me, I mean, if, if I, this isn't what you said, then correct me. But uh, you find it almost impossible, if not impossible, to get rid of Lyme unless you deal with these EMF exposures. Uh, am I right on hearing you correctly? Yeah, this, of course, this gets into some complex um, uh, findings. So, uh, first of all, the man-made electromagnetic radiation is affecting uh, the microbes in our environment far yeah. more really than it does our body cells. Our cells are pretty evolved and pretty stable. They, did, they do get affected, there's no question. But what gets mostly affected inside of us is our whole microbiome. All the living things in us are suffering. And so we know that Lyme and other bugs, also the molds, they're intelligent. And so when they feel threatened, 
they have embedded in the, the DNA certain sections that they can activate to basically turn into a poisonous beast that punishes the host if the host isn't nice to them. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, everything in life wants to live together, communicate, copulate with each other, right. and be in harmony with each other. And the, we have many patients that we found when we did the PCR testing, they had a high body burden of living Lyme spirochetes, but they were absolutely very dynamic, healthy people with a healthy yeah. outlook in life. And Absolutely, very yeah. And so it is not the microbes in us, it is the difference having happy microbes in us or upset microbes. And so the first step in turning the microbiome that we have, the entirety of all the bugs that live in us and with us, to turn them into happy bugs, the first step has to be to reduce the exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields. There is absolutely no question with that, and it has been the single most rewarding um, thing that we do in the office, you know, that sets us aside from many other offices that, that we don't just jam the antibiotics down the throat of the patients. You know, we, we first of all look at the environment and how that is the driving force of the illness. And so, yeah, so that's step number one is get rid of the electric environment to the largest degree possible. Step number two is, yes, the, the air that the patient breathes day and night, the home air is a huge important issue and if it's full of mold and mycotoxins, oh, yeah. it needs to be handled. And for that, we found a very inexpensive solution. It's a propolis vaporizer um, that at a certain temperature, creates a monomolecular uh, mist of propolis and leaves a very subtle, gentle aroma in the air. And it, these are particles that are the, carry the highest negative charge and they bind to any dust particle, but also to any mycotoxins, all the mycotoxins. This is new to me. Um, mm -hmm. So therefore, mm -hmm. how do my viewers or listeners, um, you know, give us a little detail here and I can have Ashley, you know, put a link in um can yeah. they, order, they can order that from your site you know i mean uh let, let's yeah the, the propolis vaporizer that's an italian invention and it's sort of like invented by an old beekeeper and then passed on through several generations in italy and so um, yeah because pro propolis is from uh, uh, be uh, bees i'm right i mean that, that's part of the honey that is the antibacterial part yeah, well, it's the part that the bees are using to winterize the hive, you know, to, to basically use it as this kind of concrete that they fill the gaps in the beehive. And it's antibacterial and very, very strong antiviral. In fact, yeah, antifungal as well, as I In fact, for the, for the coronavirus, it's probably the most effective tool, is the propolis. Um, but, you know, this is not about this, but to clean up the home environment, people need to have in, at least in the Northwest, you need to have the propolis vaporizer, and at least in the rainy months, it should be running 24-7. So when you say a propolis vaporizer, so is it a regular vaporizer that you put propolis, a, a liquid propolis into? Yeah, uh, there's, there's a small cartridges, uh, pre-made, this organic, biodynamically grown, uh, you know, uh, educated bees. And so it's a fantastic, uh, high-quality propolis. And it's a special instrument. Key Science has it. You know, it's, it's called uh, well, the Propolis Vaporizer. Okay, Key Science. We'll put the link here. Ashley will find the link, folks. KI, KI Science. Yeah. Okay, KI Science. KI Science. And then uh, they sell the Propolis uh, cartridges. Yeah, the little cartridges that go in. They have to be replaced every ten days. It's about ten uh, two dollars for ten days. You know, so it's very affordable. And it's a fantastic treatment. So my Lyme treatment starts with that, cleaning up right. the home for mold and cleaning up the electric environment. And then the next step is, you know, what do you give the patient? Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's stop. Like, let's talk about that. Right. So um, I think that's a unique uh, approach already. And I agree with it because if these other stressors are affecting the person, you know, good luck, right? You're not, you're not going to uh, make an impact here. But okay, so then let's talk about what you're 
giving the patients. One of the things that I can say I've learned is you know, these critters are smart, right? You have to rotate things. You can't just put someone on this protocol, keep them on the protocol. We have learned that changing things, fooling it, you know, backing it, it'll back into a cyst form, come back out. So talk about your approach now that we're actually giving them something. What do you give them? What are your best finds? Give us your, your best things that you've found. And I'll throw some in myself. Yeah, so, uh, so first of all, I treat patients by the theory that the best treatment should always be a combination of three things. The psychological element has to be in the, in the treatment. The second one, some aspect of biophysics, using lasers, using infrared light, using sonar yeah. therapy, um, using vibrational tools and all that. And the third leg is about chemistry. So it shouldn't be just one, it should be a combination mm -hmm. of the three. And so in terms of the psychological work, you probably know I use the family constellation work and some direct one-on-one -on -one, uh, body bio feedback uh, counseling technique, you know, that, that I kind of groom to my own needs. It's called psychokinesiology. Um, that's one part. And then in terms of the Lyme, we do like some of the, the new tools, the Wave 1, I think it's called. It's a device that uh, you put on the wrist and it shines light into the blood vessels and the light piggyback on the light of the frequency. No, I've seen that. I haven't, I haven't used it. Uh, you're getting good results with it? Yeah, yeah. It just takes about three months before you get results. So it's not mm -hmm. a... It's not a sprint that's a kind of long distancing, but right. it works really well. It, it certainly contributes to the healing of the patient. And then the, uh, the herbs that we use, uh, I use exclusively herbs um, that uh, I've extracted really from the literature, you know, herbs that have shown to have effects that are beyond what antibiotics can do. You know? And so the, um, the first one, maybe uh, cryptolepsis. Oh, yeah, cryptolepsis, yeah. Um, I, yeah. It's been recently shown to be 100% yeah. effective for Lyme. Um, I like uh, the um, rosemary tincture. is very high up on our list. Um, Japanese knotweed is probably... Yeah, I just read that. I mean, there was a great study. Um, I just, that was just, you know, circulating, uh, for a while. And I, I had read a study about it some mm -hmm. years ago, but yeah, it turned out out of all the things they tested, including the antibiotics, the Japanese knot would actually, not we'd actually outperformed it. So, yeah. And so we've been doing that for 15 years, you know, I've yeah. used Japanese knot weed and a rosemary and tincture and a few other, few other things, but these are the, the key ones and the, really the only new thing. Uh, that appeared on the horizon lately was the work with desulfiram. Desulfiram is a medical drug that's used by alcoholics under the name and abuse um, that uh, was patented in 1830. So mm -hmm. it's a very old drug. It was used for completely different purposes in the industry and then found that when alcoholics take it, they get sick from the alcohol and so it deconditions them, so they stop. They start disliking alcohol. It works quite well, mm. and um, it's an inexpensive drug, and it has been found to be one hundred percent lethal in an in vitro study. So there's always, you know, in vitro always means okay, um, <laughs> that's outside the body, and it's pretty easy to find things that kill things outside the body. But inside the body, the question is always, okay, how high can you go with that item before you kill the patient? Yeah. And so, um, so we found, first of all, by making the, the drug liposomal, um, that, uh, that much lower doses reach to the deeper compartments in the body. You know, we always try to reach the limbic system with the it with the hiding the last holdout is of Lyme disease. And so here's how I proceed. We, we muscle test people on the number of herbs. We got about 10 fish, uh, different herbs, some powders, some tinctures. And then we ask the patient, then, then we tell them, okay, you should take whatever two dropperfuls of um, Japanese knotweed three times a day. 
Um, and then we have the patient calculate the weekly dose of all of these. So in this case, there would be you know, six dropofils a day times seven. So six times seven. You put that amount in a blender plus the calculated amounts from the other herbs also in a blender. And then we're adding in some microfaucets that the wonderful, highly, highly uh, tested and micronized forms of lip smallest liposomal particles. It's a microphosphate. We're adding phospholipids to that in a blender and then blend the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe with a little bit of water in it. I like to also add a little MCT oil to it. And so then you're basically your own, you're almost making your own liposome by blending it with it's some the individual individualized liposomal blend of Lyme disease. And with that We've had over the years fantastic improvements in people. And so what really emerged with that, you know, once we are succeeding with taming the Lyme and the Babesia and the Bartonella, once we have that under control, what really emerges underneath is the layer of all the common viruses, you know, that we're all familiar with, the herpes type six, the Epstein bar. Right. Everybody talks about. And then people get lost in trying to treat the herpes viruses. Nobody has ever succeeded to treat Well, exactly, they're opportunes. That it's going to be there and some, you know, hiding. And, yeah, and, and yeah. so the deeper levels to that is the retroviruses. And we, I've developed you know, a couple of products. You know, one is from Key Science, KI Science, the, the powder called Retro-V. And here at BioPure, uh, we have a tincture that's very effective. It's called NB, E N, and then B. And NB. I'll have uh, Ashley, we'll put some of these up um, when we r run this for people. You know, they can put the names yeah. and we can put so, that way people aren't scrambling to get the yeah. names. Uh, and then, so, yeah. And then if you look even deeper, that's when you find the strata of uh, metal toxicology, you know, and. Um, most Americans have deep levels of lead in their bones still. Yeah. Oh, I, I, definitely, right. definitely my generation, you know, a little bit better in the younger people, but not much better. Right. Nobody talks about lead anymore, you know, because. Uh, I talk a lot about lead because it's four generations inherited. Number one source of lead is actually mom because it's in the bone. They lose yeah. bone during pregnancy. It happened to my children. You know, my wife had massively high lead levels that she got from her mom who ended yeah. up dying of, of cancer and my wife was heading down the same road and we couldn't balance her methylation her hormones were off anyways as it turned out her lead was off the chart oh and then my kids who were never vaccinated with this healthy life their lead levels were off the chart they got it from her, their mom so this is a four generation problem it's a big deal yeah yeah and so we're looking for that very carefully you know my 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 treatments for that are pretty simple. You know, we give people a pretty high dose of zinc. Um, uh, of course, most people have lead toxicity, have KPU, but that's a whole other story. So we give yeah. them a dose of zinc at B6. And vitamin B1, you know, it's published as being one of the most effective tools to detox lead. And yeah. that's largely forgotten. And we like it because it's also a treatment for uh, the coronavirus. <laughs> and so it's a good good time to do that also good treatment for Lyme disease you know the the combination that we use now of this desulfuram together with some herbs yeah, and i'll say this too you know a coronavirus the flu is is a coronavirus so this is good for the flu period right you know you're talking about you know b6 b1 thymine uh, you know zinc yeah uh, that, that's fantastic mm -hmm. uh, and so you know we give it for the lead detox specifically but as a side effect we're protecting uh, people from a whole bunch of viruses. Yeah. And then, but the, the, the most nasty metal sort of, that is the direct growth factor for Lyme spirochetes is aluminum. There's nanonized aluminum. And you know, there's been the recent studies from uh, Chris Axley, a professor in England who found extraordinary high levels of aluminum in the brain of autistic people that have died with the illness extraordinary high high aluminum levels and the same has been reported for decades on the alzheimer's brain you know being extremely high of aluminum also mercury but 
uh, aluminum is twice as high as mercury in the Alzheimer's brain. And um, now we're finding uh, Lyme, there's an English lab where we can look inside the mitochondria and we find that all of our mitochondria are yeah. stuffed full with nanoparticles of aluminum. It's a really sad story. And yeah, so, I, I, want, I want people to hear one thing because they're going to run out and they're going to either do a blood test or just a urine test. You know, when this stuff's in the brain, you're not testing it without biopsy here, folks. You know, it's not like you can run this test and go, because the, my fear is that people run and get a test and say, oh, I checked my metals and they're okay. If it were only so simple, isn't that the yeah. truth? Well, there is uh, the test from France that we have. What, what's it called? Uh, the, the one on the hand. The, the oligos. Yeah, they're all good. Yeah, you know, we, we've used them. You know, I, I just, I still have a skepticism, um, you know, about mm -hmm. all. Yeah, uh, well, the, no, it's like if you know what you're testing, you're testing the metals in the fascia of the hand, in the palm of the hand. And the metals in there are like a tattoo. And so when you take a first measurement, it very accurately gives you basically the life history of that patient. And what you will find is in everyone now that aluminum is the highest metal of all of them, then followed by either lead or mercury and cadmium, barium, you know, all of those. And so, um, but we, you know, the technology is very clean that's used. Actually, they, <laughs> they use a very simple trick, you know, the, the instrument, the oligoscan instrument, the actual instrument part, that is a part how uh, metals are determined in your blood. So when you send a urine sample or blood sample in, it's exactly that technology that looks for how much lead is there and what concentration. And they used to, to simply groom the same instrument to do it measured in the skin rather than in the body fluid. And so it's as reliable as the blood test that we get. But knowing, okay, we're not measuring blood here, we're measuring a particular tissue in the body. And so how representative that is of the rest of the body, well, the, the symptoms decide that, you know? Yeah, there's no, there's no perfect test, right? Because okay, you're measuring that tissue, but this tissue is a little different. So I always tell people there is no perfect test. We can do testing and get yeah. some ideas, but you're right. You, you can do, get some ideas, but ultimately, what are but the symptoms? Is, you know, there is a perfect test. It's called ART. Yeah. It was our non-invasive uh, brain biopsy, basically. Where yeah, we yeah, exactly. Brain yeah. And find really out what's in there and what shouldn't be in there and all of that. But yeah. anyway, so, so the, the chronic infections are hugely on the rise, not because the bugs have gotten bad, well, because we're treating them bad. Yeah. So that's number one. And from the environmental influences, you know, there's really three. There is the electrosmog, um, there is the mold, and there is the agrochemicals, you know, that are now everywhere in the air and in the food and in the drinking water. You know, glyphosate is now yeah. the leader in, in that, you know, because of Stephanie Senna's research. But there is tens of thousands of others, you know, that are in our systems that cross-react with each other and cause trouble. And so, but what in our community falsely have been focused on, what are these things doing to ourselves? Yeah. And so the new focus now in the more smart people is, what is it doing to the bugs that naturally live in your lung? What is doing to the bugs that naturally live in your sinuses? What is right. it doing to the bugs that naturally live in your brain? Mm -hmm. yeah, every organ has its own microbiome. We know that now. So bugs with foreign DNA that live in our tissues and are hugely important. There's a certain bug that should live in the breast tissue of women. When it's not there, they get breast cancer. Yeah, and so. These are all serious issues. And these microbes in us, they're highly, highly sensitive to Wi-Fi. Oh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think you brought up a great point, right? I mean, I, right now it's a very in vogue to do a lot of, uh, you know, microbiome testing, uh, whether it's Viome or there's many of these tests right now. You know, what benefit do you think it has? You know, and, and then I'm gonna ask you the same question about SNPs, right? It's also in vogue to do all the genetic testing. 
Um, you know, how useful do you think both of those types of testing are right now? And I bring those up because they're very in vogue right now, or so yeah, many yeah. practitioners are doing them. Yeah, so we know that each species of bugs communicates with every other species of bugs, and they're constantly adjusting their numbers and their activity. And each species um, has uh, at their hand about four or five uh, toxic substances that can create when they feel unhappy. And they have four or five very important uh, biochemical substances that they can shed into us that are hugely helpful for our health. Yeah, so every bug has a possibility to contribute to our health or to take away from it. This is the truth. This is yeah, absolutely really little, little talked about. And so um, looking at the microbiome is a nice beginning, but it's sort of like kindergarten because we do not know if the bugs that we see are happy bugs contributing to us or are unhappy bugs. And so yeah. until we get to all the excretion products, all the polypeptides and single peptides and amino acids and sugars that they're producing and immune active substances. Exactly. Um, it's really about that. It's not about the number of this or that but we're far away from that. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. So everyone comes to me, here's my microbiome test. Oh, what does it mean, right? I, I see very healthy, amazing people with some organisms that I would have said, boy, that's a bad guy. But yet it's working in their microbiome and it's a very happy bug. Yeah. There's no such thing as a bad guy. That's know? right. It's all part the of the microbiome. The same is really true with the SNPs and the genetic testing we uh, we know that almost for every SNP that you have, you've got some backup genes, some other clusters of genes that make up for that. And, and the, yes. truth, the truth is none of us would have come forward in evolution if these SNPs really would take away from our ability. Isn't to, it that uh, it's so true? You know, it's so, so true. They must have given us some evolutionary evolutionary advantage that we do not understand yet. And you know, I mean, there's so I couldn't agree more. Right, the, so many people with the homozygous MTHFR, they have no problem detoxing. They're very healthy people. We it, it seemed we wanted to put so much emphasis on this, and we had hope this it would lead to all these great treatments. Frankly, we have found clinically it's made no difference, absolutely no difference. Mm -hmm. And I found that with my group, you found that. So I think it's a big waste of time right now. I mean, maybe 20 years from now, it'll mean more, but you're right. Yeah. The pathways around these SNPs, are, are we, we haven't even discovered how many there are. Yeah, so we, you know, we work with a number of people that try to crack the genome and uh, with a different interpretation. And I'm watchful, waiting. Um, and we'll see, eventually there's going to be a couple of good things coming out of it, you know, that people agree on. But I also think we're far away from that. Still. I think we're far away from it. Yeah. You know, the other, the, the danger too, Doc, is that now people are running around defining themselves by these things, right? They're running around it. And that's a problem here, right? Oh, I'm, they classify themselves as this gene or identify themselves as this genome. And so now they're actually strongly creating uh, the very problem. So that's the issue I have with it too. I don't like diagnosing people with genes. Yeah, the, for me, for me, the shocking insight is that really life isn't that difficult. There's a couple of toxins in all of us that have to be brought down. There's a couple. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, you and I resonate. Hi, listen, you have gotten a lot of very challenged people well, and so have I. Mm. If you said to me, or if you said to you, what's the key? We'd both answer the same. We'd say, you know what? There, we just got some of these things out of those people, mm. and the body can heal itself, right? That's it. I mean, there's nothing more complicated than that. It's pretty damn simple, actually. <laughs> I mean, the, the wonderful thing is the body is a self healing. Yes. System, you know, and really all we have to do is remove some obstacles, and that's it. That's you know, it. And uh, it's you know, it's still, I mean, the good thing is it's still possible to be healthy in this time, but yeah. it's getting increasingly difficult. You know, the challenges are, are in front of us. And you know, I, Doug, I, one of the things I say: the perfect diet today won't get you well. You may not get well without the perfect diet. But, you know, meaning that it's a deeper issue today, right? It's a lot of these toxins and uh, uh, infections. You know, I like to say that here towards the end of our talk, you know, I, I do think 
you know, I created this tool, autonomic response testing, and that has guided us way into the future and shown us, you know, where we need to look, what we need to know, um, what products to use, and so on. I think I really like to give that to people. It's not like there's other people teaching it, you know, autonomic response testing is a wonderful tool to to be able to navigate these difficult times. And with the coronavirus now, we don't know what is groomed to do. You know, we don't know what the intent is, if there is any, whether it's escaped from a lab or uh, whether it's intentionally seeded out, uh, you know, whether it is just to force us into, um, agreeing to get vaccinated you know yeah no there, there's a lot of uh, uh, things to so we'll see how that that evolves we already had uh, some warnings from high up places you know that we should not even dare to announce that we have a, a cure for it um mm, that be in big trouble immediately be in big trouble so we got a very high from high up place in fact very high up place um and so we will need to see how it, how it unfolds, you know, but we are glad that even with long distance testing, you know, which we so developed, we have a biocomputer that can crack the voice code of patients. And so we've already treated the first um, coronavirus victims very successfully, all the people um, by just using the ART technique and so, it's it's a technique for me it has taken my fear away you know we have a tool where we can find out what's going on and we don't depend on any laboratory on any instrument to do that with and so it's just something i wanted to speak out you know i i i know we have now we have to deal with the destruction of the atmosphere you know with with the chemtrails and other uh, and nuclear radiation that has really really stripped the ozone layer in far worse ways than people know and uh, this combabulator our atmosphere that's where the the real big stuff is right now and the you know the the pollution of our food chain and uh, the pollution of all the bodies of water we have serious pre uh, problems coming up and it's not going to be like that it's going to culminate in 15 20 years this is in five six years we're going to hit like a real barrier to going forward with humanity and with with the life of all higher mammals on the on the planet you know gonna be in jeopardy and whether we collectively going to be intelligent and move forward or or whether we croak from it then it is not decided yet but i do think people reasonably people need a tool uh, that's a bit more reliable than a pendulum to um, navigate their way through um, through these next few years. So how do they access uh, your tool? Uh, my my company, my teaching company is called Klinghardt Institute. And Klinghardt spelled with the DT in the middle. <laughs> so Klinghardt Institute is not, is the the authoritative approved by me website also where we have a lot of information on material. And um, yeah, yeah, so maybe let me sum up a little bit more, you know, sort of the the crisis of Lyme disease uh, is really linked directly to the growth of Wi-Fi and to the increased uh, pollution in the atmosphere and the, the pollution of our food chain, especially glyphosate, you know, which, which lingers in our gut for decades. Absolutely. Once we have it, and in the US, even 80% of the organic food is full of glyphosate, you know, which is shocking. Yeah. And so basically, there is no more clean food left in the country, and, and you need to know that. And so um, you need to have a strategy on board to deal with that. No, and so, I agree. And the, the illnesses that we see now, the chronic fatigue, the myalgia, the encephalopathies, the, the, uh, the population is so rapidly uh, getting ill that in a few years, three, four years, everybody will have a list of symptoms and a list of diagnoses. And so, and yet uh, stepping out of that, getting back, regaining your health, is not that big a deal you know i'm 70 years old now and i'm looking back at the 
you know, the ups and downs of life and the, the different phases of illnesses that I was watching as a practitioner, you know, in the 80s, it was all about candida. Yeah. In the 90s, it was all about the viruses. And then the turn of the century came Lyme disease. Yeah. And then came SARS and, yeah. and, uh, and you know, the, then came the push where the vaccines got more and more toxic um, as an added as an added thing that we had to deal with. Yeah, we, we, there's a lot to deal with, right? I mean, there is. And so, and I know that you've taken some leadership in the detox area, you know, in, in creating protocols that are doable for people. And, you know, I've taken some leadership in coming up with non-pharmaceutical uh, treatments for the chronic infections, and we do very well with that. Um, with the coronavirus now, it's for us, you know, of course, a huge opportunity also. <laughs> it's not just, a, you know, we, we feel sorry about the, the patients that don't dare to travel now because they're so spooked um, and they are sitting at home often suffering and we can't, you know, help them beyond, beyond a certain degree. But, you know, it's, we've, we're in an exciting time. It's, uh, wow. you know, humanity is sort of committing collective suicide on one level and on the other level there is enough of us that are finding ways out and finding out to oh. support and sustain life um, until hopefully um, the forces that are behind the powers that we see will um, see the stupidity and the, yeah. um, and the destructiveness of that, that what they're doing and, and yeah. the, change change course you know we we need to see but we need tools and you've developed a number of tools i have a number of tools there's many good people out there yeah. that are offering accurate advice right now and i'd like to leave it there right now yeah no exactly i i agree i, I there's hope uh, you know you and i have dedicated uh, our lives to this because uh, right now you're right uh, there's so much um that is affecting people uh, you know but it's ironic because you and i resonate on the simplicity of how, of getting people's lives back the complexity is you know how they're really affecting us uh, with so many of these chemicals uh, chemicals unknowingly to people right through glyphosate which sprayed on our food and now in the rain and affecting every bit of our food and unknowingly in vaccines and everything and uh, you know so many of these exposures today but yet if we remove the interference the body can heal and we, we have both witnessed that, uh, you know, so there lies the hope. I agree. Uh, you know, there's some great uh, research and discoveries right now um, amongst all of the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Um, this is uh, great uh, to hear some of the things that you're doing. And uh, you and I have to get more. We have to have our, our steps have to our teams have to get us united more so we can share things. Uh, more and more things with each other. I'd love to come. Uh, you come on one of my doctor calls. Um, you know, I have a group of doctors we train um, that I train and we train together. And so I'd love to have you on that and share as well. But thank you for being on. I appreciate you, Dr. Klinghart. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank yeah. Yeah. Thanks again.